Hi, um, welcome to my talk. So, well, actually, this isn't my talk as such. This is a re-recording of my talk. This is the talk that I did for the conference in Brighton, the Sonic Rebellions conference. I was unable to record that meeting, so I'm re-recording this so that it can be shared with a wider audience. This has benefits and drawbacks. The main benefit of this is that it means that I can take things a little bit slower so I can talk about some of the issues that I'm raising and make sure that no one's getting left behind here. The bad thing is, the disadvantage, the main one, is that I, you don't see me marching about the room and gesticulating wildly at things. Um, so my showmanship is a little less showmanish, showpersonish. So with that in mind, let us begin. This is titled Towards an Anti-Capitalist Music, an Exploration of Unpaid Labour and the Artist-Audience Relationship. This talk comes from the perspective of Marxist, post-Marxist and anarchist thinking. So I'm going to be using terms like labour rather than work. And if I do use the term work, I mean it in the terms of labour, I'll have been foregrounded through the use of this term. By this I hope to show the the idea of work isn't value free. It's very much part of a system of exchange that's unequal. So with that in mind, let us begin. So this talk is going to be in three parts. The first is called Work, Audience Labour and Art and Music. Then Towards a Non-Hierarchical Form, Free Improvisation and Liberation. And What Next from Self to Others. So with that in mind, let's turn to the first part of this work. And this is about audience labour and art and music. So the idea for this came about through reading Nicholas Barad's Relational Aesthetics, which he defined as an aesthetic theory consisting in judging artworks on the basis of their interhuman relations which they present, produce or prompt. And he intended this to be a reaction against the commodification of art in the 1980s, such as the work of Jeff Coombs. However, he bemoans the sure instinct to laziness in those unwilling to engage with challenging art. And I would argue that once you introduce the idea of laziness, you also introduce the idea of work, the idea of labour. So I would argue that Blatt's relational aesthetics constitutes a form of labour and that demands intellectual and even physical labour from audiences. Now, I'm going to provide an example of this based upon a work that he discusses within this book. But first of all, let's actually think about what we might mean by labour in this regard. So, let's talk about aesthetic labour or doing the brand. So aesthetic labour is the kind of labour whereby you know, you'll be doing a job and you'll be told how to dress or you'll be told how to act. And um, we've all seen examples of uh, you go into a fashion store and everyone's wearing the clothes being sold or you meet the people in the streets who are trying to get you to sign up to the direct debits for charity. And they're given scripts and they're told to be friendly towards you. And this is all forms of aesthetic labour. Leanne Culture and Palma Acho in Doing the Brand Aesthetic Labour is Situated Relational Performance in Fashion Retail argued that aesthetic labourers are expected to work on and with their bodies in order to be what Fruin and McGarvey call an embodied billboard. So your body becomes a way of advertising the company. An example of this is Amelia 
who's quoted within the paper who said it's really hard to explain to a customer how to wear something if you're not wearing it that way yourself. So with these ideas in mind, let's turn to Felix Gonzalez Teresi's work entitled Portrait of Ross in LA. So this is an artwork that consists of a large pile of individually wrapped sweets which are placed in the corner of a gallery. The size of the pile is, or the weight of the pile rather, is the weight of an average adult male. And this is a work about a friend of the artist who died of AIDS. The artists themselves would also die of AIDS. And your role within this artwork, your role as an audience member or as a labourer, is to take one of these sweets. And through taking the sweets, the pile gradually diminishes and you enact the meaning of the piece through this. You enact the slow wasting of a body through illness. But... Without your labour, without you taking those candies, without that physical act, the meaning of the work is forever unresolved. The work can only become resolved through the labour of audiences. And I would argue that this is a form of aesthetic labour. And we are giving our labour for free to create the meaning of this artwork. So why would we do something like that? Well, if we consider the idea of doing the brand, of identifying closely with the brand from that paper, then the brand we are identifying with is the brand of culture, of art, of being a cultured and intelligent person. So. How might this operate? What would it really mean to be giving away labour for free? And to what degree do we identify with this? Well, let's return to that paper in this quote by Rory. So sometimes we pop the clothes on for a bit of a play in front of a certain customer. We would show them how it could be done. Often there was a really difficult piece. Like there's some trousers that were half see-through. And they weren't moving at all. So me and my friends, we're like, these are pretty funny. Let's grab them. Let's buy them. Then all of a sudden we sold out of them because people came in and they see you wearing them, doing them. And I want to take, bring your attention to this idea of doing them, of doing the brand. And that's what we're doing with this work, Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA. We are doing the brand of art, culture, being a cultured person. And our labour is being used to enact the meaning of the piece. Now, it's worth pointing out at this point that Felix Gonzalez Therese intended these candies to be a gift, but I'm not entirely sure whether that supersedes the physical labour that is being demanded of the audience. Not when the artist is alive, and definitely not now when they're dead and this work is held by a major gallery. Is the major gallery still giving you a gift, or are you giving the major gallery your labour and they benefit from it? And this idea that your labour or your leisure time becomes something you engage in labour within, reminds me of the Society of the Spectacle, in which the board argues that the economy transforms the world, but it transforms it into a world of the economy. So everything we do becomes part of the economy. Our work, what we buy, through consumerism, how we consume art or leisure time, everything becomes part, something that is part of the economy which benefits someone else and 
everything becomes labour and we have to be conscious of this as both artists, academics and audience members. So with that in mind, what have I chosen to do? So this is section two towards a non-hierarchical form, free improvisation and liberation. And to investigate these issues, I chose to host three free improvisations for piano live streamed on YouTube. And these were mediated by the audience who could determine the direction of the improvisation through submitting suggestions in the chat function. So I've got an image which shows how this worked in the next slide. Um, but what did I intend to do through this? Well, I wanted to collapse this hierarchy wherein audience members uncover the meaning of an artwork. And I wanted to create a non-hierarchical relationship where artists and audience work together in forming meaning. And I felt that the way I was going about this overcame some of the issues that are prevalent in free improvisation, such as what I call practice as passport. So you have Simon H. Feld talking about how he has been engaging in free improvisation for decades and that this therefore means that he is an authority in free improvisation. Or you have David Toop going even further and saying he's been doing this for his whole life. So therefore he is an expert. You also have the need for virtuosity. So you have Ronnie Scott quoted by Bailey talking about how he um, has to find new ways of playing his instrument and this is only accessible through incredible levels of virtuosity or indeed Bailey talking about how free improvisers improvisers find new ways of playing their instruments but again a huge amount of virtuosity is needed to be able to do this. You also have mysticism. So you've even Parker talking about trans and whimsy, or you've Rod Patton talking about how while engaging in free improvisation, you enter this altered state of consciousness, which is only accessible through free improvisation, and that this in turn is only accessible through the mediation, through the guide of an experienced improviser. So with these three combined, this idea that you need this unknown amount of time that you engage in practice for, this incredible level of virtuosity in this inaccessible mysticism, then audiences are forever locked out of becoming improvisers. All audiences can hope to be as an audience. They can only hope to interpret what they are seeing. They can only hope to mine the improvisation for meaning or for validity as an artwork. So let's look at what happened when I actually did these non-hierarchical improvisations. So this is a screen grab from somewhere about halfway through the third of them. And I've colour coded this so that we can see repeat um, people repeating suggestions, coming up with several suggestions. We can see how these all interact with each other. And if we look, things are getting quite witty. People are making jokes. Um, they're coming up with slightly or very ridiculous ideas for me to improvise. And then people are joking about the jokes that they've put up. Bystanders are becoming involved in this and asking to contribute in this rather than being a hierarchical form such as you find within traditional free improvisation has become, I would argue, a playful, fun thing. I and the audiences have collapsed the hierarchy so that we are rather than me being the improviser and them being the audience, we are an improvising ensemble coming up with meaning together. So 
what did I discover when I was doing this? Well, I chose to analyse my own experience through a form of critical ethnography. So, critical autoethnography is when you study self. That's what autoethnography is. You study your own experience and your own memories as an ethnographic subject. And critical autoethnography is when you do this through a lens of critical theory. So, I analysed my experience through a form of critical autoethnography developed through readings of Monica's work and memory work and fan ethnography, McKinley's writings and critical autoethnography, and Six Suits Bathsheba or the Interior Bible. So these are all works which ask you to centre yourself, your own subjectivity, within, you know, your own experience and your own understanding of yourself within your autoethnography. And what I realised is that the first step in liberating others is to recognise the ways that we inhabit and enact hierarchies as artists and to withdraw from these. We need to withdraw from our own work to give audiences a space to move into and inhabit. And this reminded me of Kropotkin when he spoke about the early utopian socialists who he argued had no means to bring about socialism and that they were reliant on some socialist Napoleon coming into being. This figure who would, through their benevolence and leadership, enact socialism throughout the world. And I would argue that if we do not question our own place, if we don't engage in a kind of critical autoethnography as artists, if we don't see ourselves as someone who is leading the liberation of others rather than being part of a liberatory movement, then we risk becoming our own socialist Napoleon, we risk viewing ourselves as the most important person in this. So that's why I discovered what am I going to do next? So I've subtitled this from self to others. And the first section of this deals with what I'm going to do when I go on to do a PhD. So I'm going to use the knowledge I've gained in this study to begin working in R the focuses on others. This will have critical ethnography and liberation pedagogy as important parts of it. So where critical autoethnography was the study of self through a critical lens, ethnography is the study of others using a critical lens. And if I am in thinking of my work as a liberatory, well, part of a liberatory movement, then I am engaging in pedagogy, I'm engaging in teaching, I'm getting people to begin to question the relationship to difficult art and difficult music. I'm asking them to question the ways in which they've been asked to engage in labour for other people. So, this is pedagogical and liberation pedagogy is pedagogy the foregrounds the liberation of others. I'll also be continuing to use critical autoethnography to ensure that I don't centre myself, that I don't end up becoming the socialist Napoleon again. And I'll be using a model based upon allowing people to form meaning rather than forcing meaning upon them. So this is work in, that allows audiences to engage in meaning-making rather than asking them to unearth meaning through their labour, which sounds quite a difficult concept. So I'll give an example. I have a, our work called RGB, which I'll be doing as part of this, and um, this is an, art, uh, an installation with three films and three audio pieces. Um, and it's based upon the 
RGB color mixing model. So this is a model whereby you can produce any colors through the mixture of red, green and blue. And there are films and audio pieces for the three colors, which will be situated within a gallery. And you come in and you find a space within that gallery where you hear a mixture of the three sounds. And this mixture is a colour. And that colour is the resolution of the piece. That's the piece's meaning, finding the colour within the you are mixing. The you are mixing a colour. That's what you're doing. And this is not something that is inherent within the piece. It's something which can only be produced through you engaging with the piece. So I am not imposing meaning. Meaning is being found by audiences. However, thinking of liberation pedagogy, I turn to fear. And I think of his quote, the hence the radical requirement both for the individual who discovers himself or herself to be an oppressor and for the oppressed is that the concrete situation that begets oppression must be transformed. So we must seek a transformation now. And with that in mind, I developed a series of questions that we can ask ourselves as artists, as academics and as audience members. So, is there art free of labour? If not, who benefits most from this labour? So, if we are asking audiences to engage in labour, are they becoming liberated through this engagement or are they lending us something through their engagement, through their labour? Are we centering ourselves or others? And finally, what would it mean to change the ways in which we practice our art? What might it mean to produce anti-capitalist art or post-capitalist art in which labour is either not present or used for the liberation of audiences? Because art is about discovery, new possible meanings, nuances, revolutionary worlds. And with that, that's my talk over and these are my references. Thank you so very much for your time. Um, if you're viewing this on YouTube, I'm going to be uploading a few supplementary videos which give more details regarding some of the issues raised here and some of the thinking that goes into this. Thank you so very much. Bye.